Welcome to New Perspectives on RVN Television. I'm your host, Barry Lefkowitz. Last week, we did part one of a very, very serious issue dealing with birthing deaths amongst black women in hospital settings. And we're most fortunate to be able to have part two and have back again uh, for this week uh, Dr. Karen Scott, uh, who is a nationally renowned OBYGN doctor, yes. and uh, who uh, wanted to be a scientist, but in some ways is is still being a scientist yes. uh, when it comes to this. Uh, could you just quickly and concisely uh, share with the audience? Uh, what this issue is mm -hmm. that we're uh, now doing part two on. Yes. Thank you, Barry, for having me back. So what we've been discussing is, you know, overall birthing in this country is, pro is probably one of the most dangerous things to do. Globally, the United States ranks is the only high income country that's on a list of having the highest rates of, of pregnancy related deaths. So anyone that gives birth is probably having one of the worst times and experiences in a hospital setting globally. Now, when we look at that across racial lines, we're seeing that there's a disproportionate rate of death and dying, particularly among black and birthing people. And research has already demonstrated and shown us that even when we control or remove factors at the individual level, such as age, um, their body mass index or their weight, having mm -hmm. a prior cesarean birth, um, having pre-existing medical conditions, which are all important and can contribute to the quality of health, but it's actually not the driver. So we have studies that show once you remove those things, this disproportionate rate of death and dying that's impacting black women and birthing people and indigenous people um, is actually based on variations in the qual quality of care that's provided to black mothers and birthing people within a hospital setting, but also across other hospitals. And part of that variation in how the care is provided is one of the contributing factors. What we ended talking up with is obstetric racism. So it is language and behavior um, that is representative of a, an approach to healthcare that says black mothers and birthing people are unworthy right, of all the advancements in technology that we have. And so despite having advancement in reproductive technology, social protection, such as high income, education, marriage status, none of those things are actually working for black mothers and birthing people in terms of the, of the quality of care that we're getting and therefore our thriving and livelihood after birth and, and um, beyond birth. Yeah, and we'll remind the audience that in terms of the birthing deaths uh, amongst black women, it's 41.4% to 13.7% in terms of white women. Um, yes, so I, I just wanna add to that, that that's the national rate. So right. there's a three to four difference, but in certain states, it can be as high as eight to 12. So I just wanted to say that that Three to four is the national. Okay. But when we look at different states in the country, that difference can actually be as high as 12 fold. So it is a crisis that is happening that the current solutions are not working to help address that. And if, I'm, if I recall correctly from our conversation, New Jersey, the state of New Jersey has one of the worst records. Mm -hmm. There's, yes, there are some specific states where that that rate is much higher than other states. Um, and there are other factors at play with that too, where it's not just the rate of those who are dying, who have died, and the rate of almost dying or surviving, right, a near miss, um, but other factors around, right, different policies at the state level or within a hospital setting 
that actually allows for this to happen without any accountability to addressing the issue. Now, because we're, we've supposedly have come out of the uh, pandemic, the population of the United States has become uh, very familiar with the CDC mm -hmm. because we heard every single mm -hmm. day uh, on television, in the newspaper, on the radio, mm -hmm. the CDC and the pandemic and everything. Uh, so uh, when I say about the CDC, there should be some uh, familiarity for our audience. Yes. But uh, you wanted to cite uh, a recent mm -hmm. CDC report that actually dealt with this issue. Yes, yes, Barry. So in September 22 of just last year, the CDC released a new report describing again the kind of distribution or the rate of pregnancy related deaths across more than half the states in the United half the states in the United States. And the kind of driving point for that article was saying that 84%, so 84%, so eight in ten deaths that are happening around pregnancy are preventable. And I think the public needs to know that because again, it's not at the level of the individual. That 84% that of preventable deaths, meaning there's something abhorrent about the hospital systems and structures that are facilitating these deaths because the majority can be prevented. And also the report described that although 13% of the women's population in this country are black women, one in three women who do die around pregnancy are black. And so again, there is something that is going on around the hospital's response or lack of response mm -hmm. or delayed response or inappropriate response to black women and people who are pregnant so that though we as a group represent only 13% or one in eight women in this country, one in three of us are dying around pregnancy consistently in a country that spends billions of dollars on healthcare. Now, some will say that this is really an issue of education mm -hmm. and sophistication mm -hmm. uh, of the patient. Mm -hmm. Why do you believe that is an inaccurate statement? That is such a great question to ask because I can imagine your audience is wondering, you know, what if we just improved access to education? What if we improved access to health education? Mm -hmm. What if we improved people's literacy or their ways to navigate the system? Those types of supports and solutions are important, but they're not the solution. And the example that I would like to share briefly that I hope your audience can, can resonate with experiences, Serena Williams, if you have access to any streaming shows, particularly one that's on, on cable, um, Serena Williams tells her story in her own voice, and I watched that documentary. Serena Williams, who's- Yeah, and just as a reminder to the yes. audience, uh, Serena Williams a, is one of the greatest tennis, women tennis players. Athletes of play. all time, of the right. world, yes. So someone, and you can see her on commercials, by the yes. way, constantly. So someone who knows and has known their body since their childhood, <laughs> right? That is a part of how they excel. She had a pre-existing condition that she knew of. She became pregnant, chose to keep the pregnancy, went through the pregnancy, and at the time of birth, she had to have an, an abdominal birth, so a cesarean section. And in the course of that, again, she had a pre-existing pre condition that she shares herself. So I'm not breaking any um, uh, uh, privacy issues, but in the documentary, she shares that she had a pre-existing condition of, of developing blood clots, blood clots right? Yes. Which in pregnancy, Pregnancy is a risk factor for developing a blood clot. So I didn't when, know that. Yes, it is. It, it is. So when a person or woman chooses to stay pregnant, those risks of, of a lot of health conditions, which if they were in a non-pregnant person, would be lethal. But because we are people are growing another human being inside of them, the body adapts to accommodate the development of life. So she knew that going in. She actually began, according to the... Um, documentary, she began to experience chest pain. She knew because she's experienced this before and she's the greatest athlete of all time. She demanded a CAT scan or an imaging study to show that there were blood clots and to get treated because that's what her health condition has been. 
In the documentary, she talks about not being believed by the nurses, by the physicians, her, I think, having to walk you know, to the nurse's station outside of the room. Now, mind you, she's recovering from a major abdominal surgery where she's given birth. She is she wealthy. She had a C-section. She had a C-section. Right. She's okay. wealthy. She's educated. She's married. She is Serena Williams. And her husband was white. Thank you, Barry. Because you can say that. Yes. I know. That's critical. Because of all those are all things that would normally protect people. They did not protect her. They delayed in treating her. They dismissed her. They denied her. She's not only fighting for her life, but that of her children. But also, she wants to be here beyond the birth. So she ultimately had the casket, and lo and behold, she had a blood clot. Now, I know there are protocols that have to, have to be followed. I'm not negating that's the first line of evaluation, but it's the manner in which that we communicate with patients to let them know that you are safe here, we listen to you, we believe you. Like just communicating that these are the steps we must take, but we are going to take the best care of you. That's not happening. There's a level of dismissiveness disrespect that happens when black women are communicating and insisting and asserting themselves that then they become a threat to the system when you are someone like a Serena Williams who's demanding you treat them properly. So obviously it's not just about poverty. Exactly. Um, in the pre-prep uh, you had shared a story of a black mother mm -hmm who wasn't listened to mm -hmm. uh, and ended up having her water break when she was in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share with the audience what are the implications of that kind of situation and why your work is so important to the healthcare system mm -hmm. and actually people forget about it, but the cost of healthcare to the system. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barry. So one of the stories that has happened to many black mothers and birthing people. And I'm saying that because this is probably like, um, not a minor story, but the implications are not as severe as what other black women and birthing people have experienced. So in this example, a black mother who is pregnant, um, let's say she's had prior births before, she is aware that she's in labor, goes to the hospital triage, I'm here, this is my pain, this is what I'm having. The nurse, in triage dismissed her pain saying you didn't look like you were in pain you're on your cell phone um, you were just here three days ago and I checked your cervix so why are you back like all of these barriers to just mm -hmm. responding to someone who's back in the hospital with pain who's experienced birth before and knows that probably this is time well she was continuously denied a cervical exam meaning an exam within the vagina to see if the cervix was open, if it was soft, if, you know, if labor is happening, is the baby on the way. She was told to just go back home. You're not ready because you don't look like you're in pain. So she's going to the restroom, probably to, you know, clean up because whatever, to prepare to go home. And as she's in the bathroom, <clears throat> the bag of water that the baby sits in is actually bulging out of her vagina because guess who knew that her baby was coming? <clears throat> she did. And so, of course, now what was not an emergency becomes let's pull the light, let's call, let's get on our little microphone or our phones and say stat birth in the bathroom. So people are gonna come rushing. The OB physician, the labor and delivery nurses, probably peace and the neonatologist, all the baby people, the team for the baby, the team for the mother. And now we're, are we gonna have a baby on the floor or do we have enough time to move her from, the, from standing or squatting to a labor and delivery bed, hospital bed, to a labor and delivery room with all the fancy equipment. Will we have time or are we, are we just gonna be able to birth here on the floor? So the baby was born. Now in this scenario, there is a particular bacteria that we screen for in all pregnant people. This is not okay. specific to black people. Anybody that's pregnant that's about to give birth, we screen for this particular bacteria because we know if this bacteria is present at the time of screening only during pregnancy, that we need to offer the baby at least two doses of an antibiotic before the baby comes out. Comes out, okay. Because if that bacteria is present and there are no antibiotics, then more than likely the baby will have to probably stay in the neonatal intensive care unit or special care nursery, possibly get IVs, possibly get antibiotics, or may even get sick and have a longer stay. Those things could, be, could have been avoided if the nurse and the team had just listened to the black mother who says, 
I think my baby's coming. I know you checked me just this morning, but something has changed, right? And so this ongoing delay, dismissiveness, denial, it changes the diagnoses. It becomes the wrong diagnoses, the wrong response. And we now have additional care or maybe a prolonged hospitalization. Maybe a baby with an infection. Definitely have a mother who's traumatized and nobody believed her. And now she's having a baby possibly in the, bath, in the floor of the bathroom. Like that type of denying of someone's need can change and alter the way a person thinks about themselves, the way a person feels about themselves. Um, we have to take mm -hmm. a break. <laughs> it's time for a commercial break. But please stick with us. Uh, Dr. Um, Scott is going to close out and help us understand uh, the role that can be played mm -hmm. uh, in terms of proper obstetrics uh, and also the role that legislators can help play in making sure that the number of people who are dying in birth, especially, we're not a third world country, so please. Stick with us, we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Bob Hokertle from Kings Road Brewing Company. I'm here to tell you about a brand new show on RVN television called Cooking with the King. Each week, we're going to taste and sample some of the best beers the Kings Road Brewing Company has to offer. And we're gonna to talk to area chefs and restaurant owners as we pair our beer with their signature dishes. We're going to teach you how to cook and eat like a king. Cheers. Welcome back to New Perspectives. Uh, we're having uh, quite a discussion uh, with Dr. Karen Scott dealing with the issue of dying and almost dying in terms of childbirth with the significant numbers being amongst black women. Um, in regards to the seriousness of this issue, uh, you know, in our region mm -hmm. here where we're shooting this show, a lot of the healthcare providers are people of color. Mm -hmm. So yet New Jersey has one of the worst records nationally uh, in regards to this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so how can that possibly be when we are finding many young men and women who are persons of color in the healthcare system? Mm -hmm. That's a great question and it is one that must be approached delicately, so I'm gonna try my best to explain this, so. You don't have to be woke. Right. Um, so what you're <coughs> describing is what we call racial or cultural concordant care which okay. means that the race or the culture of the patient matches or aligns with that of the provider. And we have seen better outcomes when we have that type of concordance. For example, women providers, like people who go to women providers actually have better outcomes. And so we know that that is one way to help address the discrimination that happens in healthcare based on some person's race or gender identity. So when it comes to racial concordant care between persons of color and people of color, yes, that is a solution. The concern is that we are all trained in similar systems of care, meaning whether we're in nursing or medicine or social work, that that underlying um, approach or perspective that we've been taught is actually that certain races, particularly like the black race, is biologically inferior. There were studies done, or comments I should say made, they were made, they were translated to like medical science that said that black folks may have had like smaller brains, right? That we have thicker skin and that we don't feel pain in the way that other people do because we were able to endure so much hardship during slavery. Some of those ideas or ways of practicing are in modern day textbooks. So even though we, I as a black woman, and I'll Go use- Go back again. Oh, you heard what I said, Barry, yes. In existing textbooks. In the medical textbooks? In nursing, yes. There are diagrams and images and explanations around us not being able to feel pain the way that other people feel pain. 
because we have thicker skin. I, 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 I have this I know. comment that I'm taken back, but go ahead. Well, I mean, I, I think that, again, that's why earlier, in, I think in last week's segment, I talked about there are a lot of black women in social sciences and humanities history. Like, if we actually were to not always prioritize medicine and nursing, and look at the kind of activists and the social sciences people, like anthropology, sociology, mm -hmm. history, they've been describing these things for really decades. One example, W.E.B. Du Bois, I believe in 1906 with a study, I believe in Atlanta, the CDC actually documented the racial disparities and inequities and the infant mortality rate, 1906. That's like 117 years ago. Yep. So we've known the concern is that we have, we're not as a health system being held accountable. So in my training, I'll speak to myself, as an OBGYN, I became the very monster that I did not want to be. Remember I said I went to help activate the power of, of women in making decisions around their bodies, their mm -hmm. partners, and their families. And I am from the South, black woman, Southern woman. And right. I became the very thing that has over centuries harmed us the most in OBGYN because of the ways we were trained to think about people who were fit to reproduce, fit to be a mother. And if you looked like me or you were brown or black, there are folks who are holding licenses in nursing and medicine who believe we are not fit to do those things. So even though there can be racial concordance or the same race between patient and provider, we just must be concerned that's not the only solution and that we really need to address the practices, the language, the behavior that is violent or controlling or just unethical and inappropriate in the field that we're in, not just the race, but it's really about our language and behavior that's unchecked that leads to denying someone getting admitted to the hospital when they say that they're having a baby. And now it's an emergency now the baby and her mom. Which costs more to the system. Right, all these <coughs> other interventions now have to go into play when we, when we could have had a normal, beautiful birth in the room and the baby and mom potentially go home within a day or two. But now I we might, have these other things. I, mm -hmm. I, I have to share with you, I delivered uh, our second daughter. Look at you. Mm -hmm. Yes. I so have that. My, I have my catcher's name. Good, but, but th that, when, that when delay is causing a cost, yeah, right? But when you talk about a solution, mm -hmm. <clears throat> who can help play a role in addressing patient safety mm -hmm. and the elimination of what you have been referring to as the obstetric racism? Yes. So <clears throat> I'll say quickly, so we can't change what we don't name. Right? We can't change what we don't measure, and we can't change what we don't monitor. So going back to the patient report experience measure of obstetric racism that I validated, it's published. We're actually approaching our one-year anniversary on March 18th of mm -hmm. this year for one-year publication. I developed a scale so that we could name it, right? so that we could measure it, so that we can monitor it and hopefully prevent or mitigate acts of obstetric racism in the provision of care, in our interactions, counseling, communication, decision-making, even in how we communicate about health in the health chart, in the record, or in a patient sign up between providers. Um, what I would like to see with the help of legislators and health plans, also lawyers and legal activists, is how do we then hold hospitals and actually health plans accountable to naming obstetric racism as an adverse event? I just recently was published in the British Medical Journal of Quality and Safety so that now we say emotional safety is patient safety, but we need to have accountability around naming it, measuring it, then training um, hospitals to, providing support to hospitals to retrain their staff and their clinicians around the appropriate, worthy, like the language and behavior that honors people's dignity and their autonomy and their agency um, that doesn't stigmatize or shame them for asserting their right, their power to say no. We can have informed consent and informed refusal. And with the means, like that shouldn't be a way where a system gets to use like child protective services or calling security or calling the police 
to address a black man or a black woman who are asserting their autonomy because they can. I mean, that's a patient, that's a part of a patient's bill of rights. Right. Um, <laughs> so we need to hold hospital systems and health plans accountable. So not only measuring the problem, but preventing and mitigating that, involving human resources around professional right development, the medical staff around um, credentialing, right? The state around a licensure, <clears throat> excuse me, by measuring it and looking at how the variations in quality and safety, right, depend on who's at the birth. Is it a midwife? Is it a physician? Is there a time of day? Like which shift of the hospital are we seeing these repeated acts, mm -hmm. right? So that we can say that it's not an individual problem, it's a systems problem. But how could we rely on the state, right? 50% of births are paid by Medicaid. So what would it look like to have every person who's dependent on Medicaid, who identifies as black, to take this scale, we generate these scores, and we can then report back a more robust evaluation of quality that health plans don't get right now as we're speaking. Right. Health plans are reimbursing hospitals for care off of what we know, we call it claims data, numbers. Numbers that talk to the diagnoses, numbers that talk to the procedure but no number that talks to the impact from the patient's perspective. And so I'm calling on legislators, right, to consider a way to mandate this because hospitals are acting without recourse, without accountability. And it is a hidden story, hidden stories of harm that no one gets to see or read about because we have these particular numbers and those numbers don't reflect the narratives of harm or the narratives of resistance, like having a doula. One of my studies also look at having a community support person at the birth, at labor, birth, and postpartum. Remember, I had to have a doula for my own COVID care. Right. Our data shows that we can significantly reduce these acts of obstetrical racism if someone is at the bedside advocating on behalf of the patient who may not feel that they can advocate when, they're new, when they are essentially you know, it's a life or death transition that's happening. Well, speaking about advocating, mm -hmm. uh, if you can look into yes. this camera here and tell people how they can get a hold of you. Yes, so please um, look for us, birthingculturerigor.com. Um, you can find us on the website. You can also find us on social media. If you have Twitter or Instagram, our handle is at cultural rigor. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at RJ. E P I O B I Warrior, R J E P I O B Warrior, and please um, follow us. Learn more about ways that you can also advocate for Black mothers and birthing people, and by doing that, making birthing in the United States and hospitals safe, high quality, and affirming for all people. Dr. Scott, we thank you for having the courage of your mm. conviction and willingness to take on the system. Thank you, Barry, for having me. Uh, to my audience, as always, uh, I thank you for allowing me in your homes each and every week. And please, please stay safe, stay well. We still have the pneumonia, the flu, the COVID, and God knows whatever else is uh, now plaguing us from a healthcare standpoint. Take care. See you next week. Thank you.